You are listening to a Sustainable World Radio podcast. Sustainable World Radio brings you in-depth interviews, news, and commentary about positive solutions to environmental challenges. Solutions that adhere to the permaculture ethics of earth care, people care, fair share. Are you interested in learning more about permaculture projects around the globe? How to plant a food forest? Restorative design or ethnobotany? Then stay tuned for Sustainable World Radio. I'm your host and producer, Jill Cloutier. Welcome, Mariko Gifford, to Sustainable World Radio. Yeah, thank you for having me. Oh, I'm thrilled to have you. And Mariko is the is a farmer and owner of Moringa for Life. And she has a farm in Vista, California. And I had the good fortune to go on a tour there a few months ago. And it was fabulous. And today on this podcast episode, we're going to be learning all about this amazing plant, Moringa. So Mariko, if you could share with our listeners, you have an interesting story. You discovered this plant years ago. Um, in your work, in your past work. And can you tell us a bit about what what drew you to this plant and why you're so excited and why you're devoting your life work to Moringa? Years ago, I was an organic inspector and spending a lot of time and energy and work with farmers on soil health and getting that soil quality right for growing the best foods. And I had the idea one day at a specific farm where we really were having a lot of uh, challenges on this particular parcel. And so I had the idea if we could find one you know, product, one plant to grow that had the most amount of nutrition. So I went on a search for a plant with the highest amount of nutrition. And I searched botanical libraries and herb books and the Materia Medica and all the different places that I could think of to find the most nutritious plant. And one day I had a perennial seed catalog, and I think that's what it was called, perennial seed catalog, and in it listed, had moringa in there. And it said on the description, the most nutritious plant on earth, and nothing more. And I thought, well, that's what I said I was looking for, but I'd never heard of this plant. Uh, But so it was very curious to me, so I got the seed and planted it in my greenhouse and kind of left it because I had kind of a hectic life at that time. And When I came back, my greenhouse was just literally taken over by this plant. And it grew so fast and so vibrant. The color of green is really what captured me. It just literally took my breath away. When you see how vibrant green that is, I just was like stunned and then so curious about it. And at the time, there were four websites that had anything to do with Moringa. So that's 15 years ago. It was very, you know... The internet was just really getting going, and um, now there's hundreds of pages of websites. You can hardly get through them all. So I knew from the beginning I had to get information out to people about this plant. That was already my first clue. Nothing is known about it. It's not listed anywhere. And as I learned about it and started to work with it, it just drew me in more and more. So the listeners know exactly what plant we're talking about. Can you tell us the Latin name of this plant? Yes, Moringa oleifera, and that is the uh, variety that I grow, and that is the variety that's the most studied. There's quite a few others. There's 13 others. Another one that's starting to be studied is Stena patella, similar to oleifera in a lot of ways, but the um, studying of the nutritional values has not been done in a wide enough range. And I also started to grow that at one point, and it was a little more problematic. Uh, they didn't survive. So, you know, I needed to have something that was really, really hardy. Uh, What zones does Moringa grow in? Yeah, this is really an important part of of understanding Moringa. It's a tropical plant. And that means the equator, the Tropic of Cancer, the Tropic of Capricorn. So in that belt around the planet, that's the best place to grow Moringa. We're in zone 9 in San Diego, so we have a shorter season. And it's, the, and it's based on not only heat, but sun hours. So, so a lot of people try to just create enough heat for the plants. So they're in Minnesota, and they put it in a greenhouse, and they put heaters in there, and they're keeping it warm. But what's also affecting it is the number of sun hours. It's really important to know your zone. If you're interested in growing Moringa, I have 
fielded so many um, questions and tragedies of you know, moringa that has died because people tried to grow it in their area, but it, they don't, you know, it's not a, a tropical area. It's, it's maybe Oregon, and they only have that heat in the summer. So when you have a summer, the summer month that is matching the tropical zone, that's your season for moringa only. So if it starts to die down, it's because it's going dormant, either because of lack of heat or sun hours or both. Before we get into the nitty gritty and the wonderful details of growing moringa, maybe we should tell, um, if you could tell our listeners why they should grow this plant, what is it about this plant that so impresses you besides the high nutritional value? What can people use it for? The amazing thing about moringa is, is how wide a reach it has. So the leaf, of course, that's what's being studied for um, nutrition. It has all the nine amino acids you need to get from food. It has, you know, this wide range, vitamins, minerals. But what it's also good for is, for example, animal fodder. And that's a research that has been done in Nicaragua by a man named Nikolai Feudel. He's now retired. But he did a lot of research on the amount that you can be giving to um, cattle milk and improve milk production for cattle, improve weight gain by high percentages. And he lays it all out. So for the whole dairy and milk industry, you know, milk industry and meat industry, we have a non-toxic, easy-to-grow food for that has no, no, no byproduct residue that can increase milk production and meat, you know, weight gain. It's also something that in uh, developing countries for people, that's one of the things that they also need. It's also, in his research was for um, agriculture. So it has a, a plant enhancer. It's a growth enhancer. We want to say, you know, growth hormone, but it's really not a hormone. It just has so much nitrogen in the leaf production that you can take that and juice it and dilute it and spray that as a foliar spray, and it gives nitrogen right, right away. It's an easy uptake for plants. And so he showed a lot of increase, and you see it just like it looks just like conventional agriculture fields that he planted. A sprayer, you know, backpack sprayer or big machine going through. But what's coming out is a moringa foliar spray. So it's quite impressive. And so when we look at how to feed the world, we're really looking at how we can do it in a way that doesn't cause any toxicity to plants, animals, or soil. And the soil is so enhanced by moringa because of that amount of nitrogen. So if you're looking at a soil that you need that nitrogen fixing, it's different than a legume, which moringa is also a legume. Even though it has a tap root, it is functioning like like a legume because it has that, that nitrogen in the leaf. The seed of this plant also produces an oil when you press that out, and that oil is really good for skin issues. So it's already been researched pretty widely for skin regeneration of skin cells. So it's for cuts and scrapes and wounds. It's anti-aging. It stimulates the, the skin in a multitude of ways. And once you take that oil out, what's left is a seed cake. And that seed cake is a coagulant, and it's being used to clarify water. So it's important to notice that it's not purifying it. It's clarifying it as a coagulant. Other types of um, water systems like alum is used as a coagulant to take particulate, you know, turbidity out of the water, and it weights it and settles it to the bottom. So what you have is clarified water. And it's so much more beneficial. There's so many people who die of issues that have to do with drinking contaminated water that it can highly improve that. The part that's really amazing about Moringa, if you look at the planet, and where Moringa grows the best, that belt all around the tropical zone is also where the World Health Organization has identified as the highest amount of malnutrition. So it's a matter of getting people that information, how to grow it, how to consume it, so that we have that whole belt of, of our planet being well fed. And what was astonishing to me was that all parts of the plant are edible and or medicinal, which is pretty rare. It is rare. I don't know of another plant, and I've studied a lot about this plant and others. Um, and when we say edible, not not all parts are edible, like that we know for sure could be, but um, we don't have enough research to know. 
So like the bark has some tannins in it that might not be digestible, but there is a, a dye that's produced. It's a blue dye from the bark. So all the parts are usable. The root has some biology that has some toxicity. So it could be the amount, just like other herbs that we use, have some toxicity. That's the amount that you use that could cause a problem. But the root has been traditionally used for low blood pressure. The leaf has been used for high blood pressure. Wow. So from the same plant, the high part is for high and the low part is for low. and It, it matches in, in a really unique way. Um, it's also called the horseradish tree. So it's because the root tastes identical. I mean, I've tasted that root. The smell of it is also very similar to horseradish. You know, that's a condiment that can be made. You can make a food out of that. The only challenge is when you use the root, you kill the tree. So if you use the leaf, that tree goes on. Um, but in areas like the tropics where you have the possibility of so much moringa production, you know, you can start to get into the varieties of food out of it. Uh, the seed oil is also an edible oil. It's also a, a burning fuel oil. So it can be used for a lot of, you know, industry in very fine clockworks where you don't want to have that uh, Oil gummed up it is also an oil that is very, very hard to go rancid. A uh, high burning point for cooking. just goes on and on. <laughs> the list of things, once I started researching this, it was like, really? And I think uh, the oil was called Oil of Ben. Is that correct? Yes. Ben oil is, is the common name. And it had there had been a big oil industry before the whale oil came into the market a couple of hundred years ago. And so in Jamaica was a big um, production of moringa, and there's still uh, 200-year-old moringa trees there. People have really lost the knowledge about how to use it. They see it, and it's growing everywhere, but they don't know that they can be even the leaf. And we took a trip there, my husband and I, and did like little mini um, talks just on the street, handing people seed and in Montego Bay and saying, you know, go home and plant this. And they have a high amount of diabetes and high blood pressure. And so people were taking it and starting to use it again. It's, it's really just getting the education of people knowing what it's used for and how to use it and putting that power in people's hands. One thing, too, that we should remind or, or um, tell listeners about is the very high, you mentioned it a bit, but the very, very high nutritional value. Yes, and and that's why the World Health Organization and other health organizations have been promoting moringa for a very long time. It's new to the United States. However, we have a growing amount of overfed and undernourished population. We have epidemic obesity, uh, diabetes. All of that is eating foods that don't have the nutrition and then you have to continue to eat and eat and eat to try to get more. You know, the bodies are actually starving for food. and But if you don't have real food, your body is still searching for that nutrition. And, and that really brings me back to, and I always say this, anybody who knows me, I always say, if it's not in the soil, it's not in the plant. It's not in our food. And so a big part of my work is in the soil biology. And that is how you're going to get the highest amount of nutrition in any plant. So if you're starting with a plant that has the highest amount of nutrition and you're getting that soil biology right, you really have something. I mean, it's just a unique opportunity for people who are dealing in health issues all around the world to really start to get this plant growing in everybody's backyard. So, But the important part, like I had mentioned a little bit sooner, is to know your growing zone because your zone might only let you grow it in your summer months, and then it goes dormant. So moringa is a tropical plant, but it's also sensitive to, to freeze and frost, and it can die of root rot really fast, so you cannot let it stand in water. But yeah, once people start to see how much nutrition as a food, and you eat a small amount and you feel nourished, so this is one of the also um, effects that I see with Moringa is people who start to eat Moringa realize that they they don't have to eat very much food. They don't feel hungry and start to get nourished. The body really starts to be able to have the nutrition it needs for healing. And that's how healing happens with Moringa. It's healing because your body actually has the building blocks for its own system to sufficiently heal itself. And that's what you're getting when you get any kind of food. It's, it is our medicine, but that has to be filled with everything that plant is supposed to have 
the way you do it is to have that in the soil so that microbiology is creating that real food substance there. That real health. And can you tell our listeners how you um, take care of your soil when you're growing your moringa? Yeah, I have my my soil made for me. So, because I use so much of it, and if people come to my my farm tour, they see that I have these big avocado crates lined up, and the moringa is inside those crates. Because we have issues like uh, gophers and rabbits and field mice who want to eat the the uh, well, the gopher likes the root. The the rabbit will take the new growth, and the field mice will eat the seed. So <laughs> you have health. I bet you have healthy um, animals running around your farm. <laughs> it's true. It's true. So I've had to just just for the amount of work that it takes um, in the short season I have. So our season is from June through maybe November. Like we do our last harvest before Thanksgiving, and um, so I'm creating the soil, and I have um, it's a topsoil that's made for me with 10% worm casting. And then I use perlite, so it's 50% perlite, so they have the drainage. And so that starts the process. And then I am creating compost, you know, thermal compost with the microorganisms and making tea, compost tea. So worm castings are a big part of the planting process. Mycorrhiza is a part of our planting process, so that you have the fungi creating more food absorption. And um, so there's... There's a number of things like that, just so that that plant, the moringa, is determining what it needs at any time and uptaking that food and having the food right there at the root where it needs it. And because I have it in those containers, so I know that I'm continually feeding that, feeding the microorganisms so that that's, you know, that plant is thriving. It's depending on me for that. So it's different than if you, are, you know, are out and you start creating your permaculture environment, all other plants that you're planting at the base of that can be doing that work too. And we have that as a part of our work is the permaculture principles because we grow also a lot of other foods here and we utilize moringa. Like today we we um, built a compost pile, our second one just for dealing with our courses so that we can be training people how to do this. And so we put moringa in that because it's a high nitrogen food. So when you're putting, you know, even building your compost, moringa is an ingredient there. How would you access that nitrogen to help plants grow? Put it in your compost, it sounds like, is one way. Moringa has nitrogen in the leaf. So the leaf can be, like I had said earlier, you know, you make a juice out of it, and now you have a foliar spray. And you can also feed that right into the soil, too, as a tea. So you're making a moringa leaf tea for the soil. Do you ferment it? I don't ferment it. Um, but I, I know that a lot of some of the additives people do, they start that fermenting process as a way to get cultures, you know, different microorganisms to grow. We haven't started to do that. I'm, once we, uh, you know, we're doing a, a project with uh, Dr. Elaine Ingham. She will, will you know, work together and determine what the the biology is specific, the balance of, you know, fungi to bacteria for moringa, for for what we need to grow. Um, Then I'll be using that information, the candida, we do some fermentation and look to see what are the fungi food or bacteria foods so that we make sure that it's having that available. Is there a zone or a place where you cannot, where moringa will not grow? Probably the North Pole and the South Pole, (laughs) (laughs) those extremes. Every place is going to have a you know a short season. If you have a summer where you have heat and full sun, you can grow moringa just during that time, and then you'd have to bring it in. So one of the things that's also really amazing about moringa is its life force. So one experiment that I did early on was to take the root right out of the ground and put it in trays. I just had this open tray, and I left it out in the elements year after year. And every season, I would take some of those roots, and it looks it's it's a tap root, so it's about six inches long. That's the size that I had at the time, and would, I would plant them every season. And every season they grew, and I did this for six years, and it still continued to have a life force in it. What you where moringa is sensitive is when you first sprout it. So this is where a lot of people, no matter where they're growing it, have trouble is a, a lot of what was so, shown on the Internet was putting it, you know, in containers and then transplanting it. 
if you're in a zone like tropical zone where you can plant it in the ground, there's no need to do this activity. This is only if you want to preserve that root and and create a nursery where somebody is, you know, growing it because it can be stored just like bulbs once it has gone through a growing season. So it's fragile to transplant in the first season. And that's because the root, it'll be white, kind of like a daikon, it'll look like. And once it's gone through over winter, it creates a bark on the root. Once it has a bark on that root, you can take it out of the ground and you can lay it out in the elements for six years and it'll still have a life force. You can plant it and it'll grow. One of the things that I'm doing for people who live in those cold zones is they can order that root on a website. It's a year-old plant. It's a yearling but it, they receive it just as the root. So once at the second year it starts to have the top on it, when our growing season starts, I cut the top off and send that to people. So in their growing season, which might be only from June to October or September, they already have a year-old tree that will start to grow and produce leaf right away as opposed to planting a seed in June and getting a little bit of growth before your, your growing season ends. But if you do, you know, um, grow it by seed, you can still store that out of the cold, let it go over winter, and then you will have your own plant the next season. It just takes more care and attention that, that it doesn't freeze if you're in a cold zone. So where you live is really, really important. There's a lot of misinformation about how to germinate a seed and all these measures, people who have called and said, oh, I did this, or you soak it in water for 24 hours and you put it in the closet and then you wait this amount of time and then it comes out and you have to transplant it and then it died. They're doing this in the winter and you don't realize that that information was, had probably, a, hopefully, other information before that saying you have to do this in June if you're in a cold season, but it, it doesn't seem that all the information comes along with it really important to know your growing zone. If, if you can grow, you know, like tomatoes and zucchini and cucumber at that time of year, that's the time of year you probably can grow moringa. Is moringa a tree or a shrub or both? Yeah, it's a good question. Moringa is three things. It's a cut and come again. So in farming, we have things like um, chard and kale and lettuces that you can grow and then you just take parts of it, you know, you harvest from it, but the plant continues to grow. That's called cut and come again. You can do that with Moringa. It's also a shrub. So the way it becomes a shrub is when the first stalk comes up, you cut it down to about an inch and you harvest that, you know, there's your cut and come again. So you have like a foot or two of growth and you can eat that and you cut it and the Moringa will send a couple of more shoots out. If that gets to be two feet tall, you cut it. There's your cut and come again. And as this happens more and more and, and you let that get taller, it'll come to be as wide as eight feet wide and six feet tall, and you'll have all of those possibility for leaf production. So there's your bush. And you can also let it grow just as a tree, which we don't recommend in you know in the areas that are have a short season if you're growing it for nutrition because it'll get taller and taller and taller and all your leaf will be, a, it's a lacy canopy and it'll be out of your reach. And you'll only have as, enough, as much leaf production as those few branches that will come out. So uh, in areas like the tropics, they have 30 and 40, 50 foot trees, but you can't necessarily get to that leaf. In the areas that people, you know, across the United States, I always recommend that people cut it down. You can leave one stock to go tall and not cut that down every time and just cut around it or leave several, you can end up shaping your tree by how you cut it back. So every time you're cutting those branches off, you're harvesting it. And once those branches start to be an inch in diameter, you can also create a cutting. So the other phenomenal thing about Moringa is it also can grow by cutting. I've tried a lot of different di diameters and the smaller the diameter, the less likely it's going to take. And in our growing season, we don't do cuttings later than October because it doesn't have enough of the sun hours, you know, that heat for it to get the first leafing out. So even you know, when you do a cutting, you have to also be doing it only in your growing zone and give it the maximum amount of time. So for cuttings, 
the spring is the time spring to mid summer late summer you can do cuttings and after that you really want to you know just let the plant stay with that branching so that your next spring you know it'll have a bigger diameter and you can cut that put it, we cut them to about two and a half feet tall so one branch might have two trees right two cuttings we cut those and put them in soil the soil that we make and we put them inside a, like a little mini greenhouse just so that it heats up a little bit more for that zone you know to be right around those those cuttings so we're, we're pampering them a little bit as the cutting. When we do the seed, we don't do that at all. It can just be out in the elements. But we know we have a short time to get that leaf to come out. So we're, we're creating a little bit more heat around it. And when you do cuttings, do you um, just put the cutting in the soil? Do you add like any plant hormone or anything to help it grow or no? Nope, we don't do anything. We, but you know, what's in that soil is the soil that I've created. So I know that it has high amount of nutrition in that. We also utilize the big avocado crates, so that's how we're growing the moringa predominantly. We have it in the ground as well. But for cuttings, we have the big boxes that we have that soil in. So in those boxes, so it's three by three by three, we can fit a lot of cuttings. So you don't have to have separate containers. And the containers for a moringa is a deep pot. It's not your shallow, regular um, nursery pot because it's got that taproot it wants to keep going down deep. You don't have to have it wide because it's not going to have branching roots like other plants. It's going to have a taproot. So we have containers that are two and a half inches by nine inches deep or four inches by 18 inches deep. You can plant a seed in that tall pot and it can stay in there for two or three years. So I'm living in Santa Barbara County. Would the moringa trees or warmer areas, but not the tropics, could the trees stay in the ground year round? Do you get a frost or a freeze? Maybe once in a blue, not very often. Yeah, so a frost will, you know, it'll survive because we get a frost here in San Diego too once in a while. Um, 26 degrees is the lowest that I've tracked for it to survive in San Diego. So also a wind chill, if you think about, it's kind of like an antenna. If you have a tree that's about two or three or four feet tall, it's going to take in the cold from that and send it down into the root. So you do want to pay attention if you have it in the ground in areas that you get multiple days in a row of frost, that can kill it and certainly freeze because it is a tropical plant. Some people do if they know that they're, you know, they're going to have some cold uh, they'll cut the entire top down and mulch it pretty heavily and put a blanket on it. And, you know, <laughs> some people really tuck it in and put a pillow. I mean, it's like when, if you're in these areas and, you know, a lot of people just love moringa and they want it to grow. So they really have to take care of it in those areas. And one thing people should know is, which I learned on your tour, was that we had two little moringa trees or shrubs. They're tiny, but they're getting bigger. Um, and last winter... All of a sudden, there it was just a stick, <laughs> and we thought Kevin was like, "We killed it! Oh no!" Uh -huh. But then it came back, and now they're just thriving. And we gave it some compost tea and compost and verma compost in the soil, and they're doing—they're great. Yeah, now. and that's what it'll look like. Ours look like that too. And um, when it's dormant, like other plants that go dormant, they're sleeping in the winter, and they'll drop all the leaves, and it'll just look like a stick in the ground or a stick in the pot. Um, and that's normal. Once it starts to get warm in those sun hours, and for San Diego, I've calculated, um, because we, you know, we have what we call May gray, very overcast days in May and June gloom. Again, a lot of overcast. So uh, when there's six days of full sun, so six days in a row of full sun, that's when our growing season starts. Even if on the seventh day it's overcast, those six days in a row seem to just like jump start it. In other areas, Oregon, right away you have summer. As soon as you have three days, that might be enough because you know you're going to have 100 days or whatever. So um, as you start to work with Moringa and see the pattern of your seasons year after year, you'll start to see. And every area has microclimates where it's warmer and it starts to warm up faster. And so that might start your summer sooner, but you still, no matter where you are, it's the sun hours that are going to determine how long that moringa goes, even if it's hot. That's always the determining factor. It's still a tropical plant. It's still tracking the sun.
How would Moringa do with this drought that we have in California and elsewhere around the world with the weather patterns or weather seems to be changing a bit? How does it survive during times of dryness? Yeah, Moringa is a drought tolerant plant because it will send a taproot. Uh, and taproot trees of all types have a better survivability during a drought because that taproot just is going down to seek moisture that you'd never see at the surface and also getting to the water table. And once it hits the water table, you never have to water it again. Those taproot trees of all types are the best trees to have during the drought season. And we are having a pretty severe drought here in Southern California, all across California. So that's really an important part of uh, Moringa for us. We are really aware of the water usage. So all of our plants get 10 minutes. We have one hour per gallon emitters, and they get 10 minutes a day. It's a really small amount of water, but it's enough because, and I'm, mon- I'm monitoring that too. I'm looking to see how that's going, you know, going through and, and testing the, the soil and the soil moisture. This is one of the challenges with Moringa is to make sure that you have it in a place where you don't, it doesn't need a lot of water intending to. And that's why, like, it's a perfect plant in permaculture because you can create your, your soil and you can put your Moringa in there and things will grow at the base of a Moringa plant because it's a taproot and it's bringing that nutrition up through that taproot, feeding those shallower roots, right, creating those different stories. And uh, so you can do that and it retains a lot of water that way. You save a lot of water when you have that biology, you have that food web. It retains water, so between 20 and 70 percent water saving when you're working on that soil base. So in drought situations, it's critical that people realize that if you can retain that soil biology, you're going to have the moisture right there and you don't need a lot. Plants will, you know, stress a little bit over it, but if you have that biology, you have nature working in your favor. And that's what we need. We need to have more of those kinds of systems set up so that those extreme weather conditions don't affect us and have everything drop because everything is so reliant on city water, municipal water, rather than nature's water. And holding the water in the soil. Yes, exactly, holding in the soil. And creating all that life for the microbiology so that now you have that whole food possibility under the ground so you have all that food possibility in your plants. So all of that is saving of time and energy and resources and water, and it's something we have to switch to because we already have gotten the confession from commercial farming that they cannot feed the planet. We hear it over and over. This is the reason they say we need GMOs because they cannot feed the planet. But permaculture can, and we already know that. Just It has to get into the whole system. We need to shift to that because we know that permaculture farms can feed the world. That's already done, proven. So it has to get into our mainstream. We have to start working with nature. Nature uh, is unemployed right now <laughs> by humans. It's time to employ those cre- those microbes. And <laughs> the plants can do their job of sucking the carbon out of the air. The soil can hold it. Let's hire nature. Right, exactly. They've been, been doing it for all this time. And it's so underutilized. It's our most underutilized resource on the whole planet. And we wouldn't be here but for that whole system functioning in the way that it has and this disturbance that we've created. And with Dr. Ingham's work, she's been demonstrating over and over and over again that you can reverse that in a growing season. I mean, it's just amazing. It's so inspiring when I've been looking at her different research and the case studies and stuff. It's like, oh. You just see it right in front of your eyes. It's undeniable. Why aren't we all just doing that? But in everybody's backyard, you can do it. You know, and her work is very accessible and easy to implement, and it makes sense, and you feel inspired all the way along. And so, you know, there's no reason to not do it. And once you're, once, at least in my case, once I was aware of the life within the soil and the whole community that's living there, it is just, for me, I just started to feel reverence for how, incredible the connections were and how they how all the beings work together it's exactly right i mean we have really lost the connection to that power source just underneath our feet and just focused on what we see above ground 
And it's really true. My whole journey with Moringa has been very connected to the natural forces, the way that we traditionally used to connect to plants by getting information from the plant intelligence and the soil. I mean, all of those living beings are all around us. And, and for the most part, we've walked around blind to that. And we see what's happened to our planet because of that. Because everybody blind going through and and creating these systems. So, yeah, that is such a critical part. And most people who start to work with Moringa extensively and feel really called to work with Moringa, they feel the same way. Wow, I, people will call me and say, kind of have a feeling like it would said something to me. And I'm like, yeah, well, what did it say? What did it tell you to do? Because it's probably giving you some instructions. <laughs> Listen, you know, pay attention and do it. Because that's virtually what I did. I just paid attention and just kept doing what I heard what I thought could be the next thing. And, and that's really how I have come to doing the Moringa certification course, the growers course, because I've seen now over the years the quality of Moringa that's being produced, and it's really been important for me to make sure that everyone is producing the highest amount of, of nutrition in that Moringa, highest quality, and that the consumer starts to understand and to know what good Moringa is supposed to look like, smell like, taste like, what it's supposed to feel like when you use it. And because it's new for most people, they don't know. And so people who are producing it, who might also not know, are just going along and thinking, okay, this is good, and people are using it. And But the effects that you have from Moringa can, are so powerful. The amount that you need to take at any one time can be very small for really big health benefits. Um, but if you're using Moringa that hasn't been grown properly or processed in the correct way. You could have pathogens and mold, and people send me their samples from all over the world. They want me to carry their product that they're producing, but I send all of even my production to a laboratory and get the microbiology tested for pathogens, coliform, it's a standard plate count, uh, and E. coli, salmonella, fungus, and mold. So I know what's going on with that, that uh, product. And some people who have sent me their product and it looks green and beautiful and it smells like Moringa and I have it tested and it's extremely contaminated. So then what's out there is a lot of Moringa that has to be treated because of the contamination. We've dealt with so many issues along the way and so now I've been certifying people to grow the way I do with permaculture principles, with um, vermiculture, soil biology, composting, correct composting, and now the, the key component will be added once we finish the study with Dr. Ingham. It will be the actual soil biology for Moringa specific. And so those will be all the pieces. It's been amazing to do these courses. People have come from all over the world. And we've been exposed to projects and the passion that people have growing Moringa once they became you know, aware of it. Every day I, I have an email from somebody whose project in Uganda or Zimbabwe and this is what happened and what do I think and so I'm really um, moving our work out into the world and the experience that I've had growing Moringa for these 15 years that I can help people uh, grow the best Moringa and people could be competitors of mine and there have been in my courses and it doesn't matter, you know, I don't work on the same business principle. I work on nature's principle of how we're going to work together and create everything in a better way. And if we are being able to support our life functions on this planet with something amazing like Moringa, we all have to have that same basic information of how to do that. I feel it's not something that I can control or contain. I got that freely from the plant itself, and so I give that freely. I mean, I, I make that available that people can come and learn. So if someone is listening and wants to sign up for your course, they want to learn to speak Moringa like you do. How can they... <laughs> speak Moringa, that's great, yeah. How can they do, where do they? Where can they find you, and how can they sign up? Well, our next, our last course for this season is um, November 8th through the 12th. So it's on my website, moringaforlife.com, under products. It's also one of the slides when you first are on my homepage, uh, and it also lists the certifications that we, we give. Um, one is for a grower, a grower certification. So it's somebody who actually will grow Moringa the, in the, this way. We'll have the soil biology. It'll be lab tested. 
and they get that specific um, certification as a grower, and that product gets a Moringa uh, Quality Assurance Certificate. Then there's also a Moringa Educator Certificate, and that's somebody who wants to be trained in all of the avenues of Moringa and growing it and, and educating people about it. And we do a PowerPoint at the end of uh, the five-day, after they've get, gotten all of that information, they can make a copy of that PowerPoint and use it and change it, you know, make it their own, and but have all that basic information. And, and so once they have um, done two lectures, and I have that, you know, the information feedback from it, then they have that certification. We also have Moringa Corps, like a Peace Corps member, and that's a certification for somebody who will do multiple um, trainings with us because they'll be um, trained in a short climate and in a tropical climate. They may never grow Moringa themselves as a crop or as a business, but they want to go and work on farms. So it's another resource that a Moringa grower can have on their farm or somebody who's trained and certified as a Moringa Corps member to come and work on their farm with them. Um, there's also Moringa trainer, so somebody who will learn to train, do these trainings all around the world. And there are two people now who are being trained by me to be Moringa trainers. Uh, one is from Mexico who's coming, you know, he'll have been to all three of my trainings and a permaculture expert and president of Permaculture Mexico, Institute of Mexico. And so they're available uh, to go to some of these different uh, places where Moringa courses could be done in a, in a location where those local people could come or, lo you know, closer countries. So a lot of the work that we're doing is across Africa. There's a well, coalition, Colorado Coalition for African Empowerment, and they have attended um, two of the courses. And so I'm training two people, one for the southern countries and one for the northern countries, so that those 19 countries who are in that coalition can go there to a country in Africa for that training. It's quite amazing, the people who come and the way in the course that they can connect to each other and each other's projects, and the projects evolve right in front of us during those five days as well. It's been really amazing to see because we're in a kind of pressure cooker when we do this because there's just no other way I have seen to give enough, you know all that information. We also do a hands-on how to harvest and process and dry and go over dealing with pathogens and lab testing and know how to read a lab test and, and, and be testing it right there and know whether their practices are you know, dealing with those issues. So a lot of very practical information, but also knowing that all of this grows within an ecosystem and getting all of those functions in nature working with you. So it's it's quite an amazing time. So that, that's listed on my website, those certifications. And um, then the next one we have won't be until June. We will also be traveling around Mexico and possibly some other places in the tropics over the winter to find places where Moringa is already growing and set up in a tro tropical setting the same course. So your um, website is moringaforlife.com. And if someone wants to email you, is the best email info at moringaforlife.com? Yes. Okay. So info at moringa, M-O-R-I-N-G-A, for life, F-O-R-L-I-F-E dot com. This has been fabulous. I just <laughs> love this plant even more than I <laughs> did before oh, I called you. Yeah. It's so, and you know, for listeners to know, it really, um, the little trees that we're growing, I eat the leaves off them and they, it tastes great. They are so uh, tasty and we do a lot of things. Once you are growing your moringa trees, you can make so many different foods like our tour and also during our course, we serve a moringa drink that is with... Um, fresh moringa leaf and other things that grow here, mint we might mix with it, or lemongrass. And so that's a fresh green drink that we make. And it's diluted. It's not just juiced because it's a very, very strong flavor and effect. And then we have different foods. So we make a pesto. We have different salads and sauces and um, desserts all made with moringa. So by the end of the um, course, when people have done the five-day course, moringa is pretty much a part of every cell in your body. <laughs> it, and it was delicious. It's oh. delicious. You know, and so our goal, people start to, you know, pay attention to our website. We will be adding more and more foods so that people see that this is something you can have in your daily food. And as a food, it becomes a medicine. People have healed so many things using Moringa, from diabetes to fibromyalgia, 
every kind of um, liver issue, a um, lot of things that deal with inflammation. And while it doesn't, I haven't seen, you know, that it like heals AIDS or heals some of these things. What it does uh, work on are some of the um, symptoms. So fatigue is in a result of so many different illnesses. And Moringa is so effective. I mean, people have used that so much for the fatigue and been able to function and live normal lives because they don't, they're not spending most of their time just trying to get the energy they need to do simple things. So it's being used for all these different health issues all across the planet now that people have become more and more aware of the medicinal uses of Moringa, but basically eating it as a food. It makes me hungry thinking about that yummy Moringa pesto that I, <laughs> that I had at your house. Good. It was so good. Yeah, it's just, uh, it's so versatile. So you can put in all different types of foods and all different types of cuisine. Traditional food for Filipinos, it's called molungai or kalamungai. And they use it in soups and a lot of the leaf that's used. In India, it's a common food. The, the drumstick tree is their common name and they eat the seed pod. They make chutneys and so forth. And even a place like India where it's, this is native to and is a part of Ayurvedic medicine, people have kind of lost the use of it. So it's kind of come full circle back to India for dealing with hunger issues. They have a lot of population with hunger, and this is a, a traditional food. So it grows wild there. But, yeah, it's, it's a fabulous food and can be added to just about anything, every kind of pesto or salsa or... Pasta, I mean, it's just really not a limit to what you can do with it. That's great. Well, thank you so much, Mariko Gifford, owner of Moringa for Life. And for information, visit moringaforlife.com. You can email her at info at moringaforlife.com. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Thank you. Thank you so much for this opportunity. It's uh, one of those moments in time for me that I can see, you know, just getting information out to people is really critical to connect with people whose passion it is to share that information. So I'm very happy about that. Thank you so much. You've been listening to a Sustainable World Radio podcast. You can find us online at sustainableworldradio.com and also on iTunes. For more information about permaculture and ecology, visit the Sustainable World Media YouTube channel, where you'll find videos about permaculture, aquaponics, organic gardening, rainwater harvesting, and much, much more. Sustainable World Radio is a listener-supported program. If you like what we do, please consider making a donation to the show. I'm your host and producer, Jill Cloutier, and thank you so much for listening. Mm-hmm.